Hello, and welcome back to the podcast that must not be named. I am Luke. I am Melissa. And we are kicking off Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. Yay, book yes. three. We've made it. All right, so this book overall is 435 pages, and that's 10.61% of this entire series. It was released in the United States September 8th, 1999. The dedication of this book is to Jill Pruitt and Ayn Keeley, the godmothers of swing. Let's get chapter one kicked off now. All right. So chapter one is titled Owl Post. And this chapter is 15 pages, and that's 4.85% of this book. And now, a voice of the Imaginary Legion. Bird, Mail, Chapter 1. Chapter 1 finds Harry secretly working on a History of Magic essay in the middle of the night. Harry does his work by flashlight because of the medieval view the Dursleys have on Harry's condition. They even locked up his broomsticks, spellbooks, wand, and forbade him from talking to the neighbors. Luckily, Harry had picked a lock and liberated some of his books while the Dursleys admired Vernon's new car. Loudly, so all of the neighbors were here, of course. Harry reminisces on how the Dursleys tried to stamp out his magical abilities before he knew he was a wizard. He also thinks about how much Snape dislikes him. We find out that Harry's best friend Ron tried to call Harry over the summer, but had enraged Uncle Vernon by screaming into the phone due to his lack of experience with telephone, resulting in one of the worst fights ever. Harry believes that Ron warned Hermione not to call him, resulting in five weeks of solitude from the magical community for Harry. Fortunately, Uncle Vernon does agree to let Hedwig out, as long as Harry doesn't use her to send and receive letters. Harry decides to call it a night at 1 a.m. and hides his homework in a loose floorboard. With a jolt, Harry realizes that he's been 13 years old for a whole hour. He goes to the window, and Mrs. Hedwig thinks about how he's gotten a few inches taller, has jet black hair, and green eyes. He thinks about his scar, the Dursleys lie about his parents' death, that they died in a car crash, and how Voldy murdered his parents and tried to kill Harry. The strange, lopsided creature flaps its way to Harry's room. The creature turns out to be two owls holding up a third. Each owl has a package for Harry. The first is Errol, who is the Weasley's ancient owl. Hedwig is one of the support owls, and the other is a Hogwarts delivery owl, which delivered a third package along with Harry's Hogwarts letter. Errol delivered a birthday present from Ron and a newspaper clipping with the picture. The clipping states that Arthur Weasley, Ron's dad, won a daily profit grand prize galleon drawing. They spent the money on a month-long holiday to Egypt to visit Bill, the eldest Weasley child, who works there as a curse breaker for Green Gods. The picture is of all the Weasleys waving at Harry. Harry looks at Ron with his pet rat scabbers and is happy for them because they are extremely nice but very poor. Errol also has Harry's first ever birthday card, which describes the mutant skeletons Bill works with. Ron reveals to Harry that they want 700 galleons and that he's getting a new wand. Yay! Ron tries to coordinate a meeting in London to go to Diagon Alley. We also find out that Percy got head boy. Shocker. Uh, Ron's present to Harry is a pocket sneakoscope, which warns the owner if someone untrustworthy is around. Hermione's card says that she is in France, but Hedwig somehow found her. Uh, she is taking the Daily Prophet and ordered his present out of it. She is fascinated by the history of Egypt and is jealous of how much Ron is learning. She has also rewritten her History of Magic essay based on some of the things she's found in France. She's planning on meeting Ron in London. Based on the package, Harry figures Hermione got him a huge, difficult spellbook, but it turns out to be a broomstick servicing kit. It has handle polish, tail twig clippers, a compass, and a handbook. Harry reminisces some more about the broomstick sport quidditch. His last package is from Hagrid, but it shakes and snaps. Harry is reminded of Hagrid's giant three-headed dog and dragon ownership and hopes that he didn't send anything dangerous. After getting ready to beat it with a lamp, Harry unwraps the parcel and realizes it's a book called The Monster Book of Monsters before it quickly scuttles under his desk. It snaps shut on his hand, but Harry manages to flatten it and belt it shut. Hagrid's birthday card hints that the book will be useful, but doesn't say any more. Harry's letter from Hogwarts is the same as it had been, but now with the addition that third years can visit Hogsmeade, an entirely wizarding village, with a permission slip from the parents or guardians. Harry really wants to go to Hogsmeade, but is worried about how to persuade Uncle Vernon or Aunt Petunia to sign the form. At 2 morning, Harry decides to call it a night and crosses off another day on his countdown to Hogwarts. As weird as he was, he finally felt normal, and that this was the first time in his life that he actually enjoyed his birthday. All right, pretty quick chapter there, I'd say. 
a pretty quick 15 pages. It really, really was. We do have a character introduction here. Uh, we have Wendelin the Weird, who was in the History of Magic book. Kept getting uh, burned over and over at the stake. So, Wendelin the Weird, do we have any location introductions here? Two. We are introduced to the town of Hogsmeade and some Egyptian tombs. Okay. Specifically... Which, of course, specifically wizarding Egyptian tombs. Right. So, magically induced... Or enhanced. enhanced. Some magic vocabulary that we have. We have a, an essay by H. Potter. Which burning in the 14th century was completely pointless? It's a pretty pretty good uh, <laughs> article title, I guess. <laughs> essay title. Uh, we hear of the flame freezing charm, shrinking potions, pocket sneakoscope, broom servicing kit, Fleetwood's high finish handle polish, silver tail twig clippers. Handbook of Do-It-Yourself Broom Care, and of course, the Monster Book of Monsters. So let's go ahead and discuss the illustration here at the beginning of Chapter 1, as I flip to my illustration of Chapter 1. And it is the trio of owls, all with packages, one of whom looks a little beat up there in the middle. Yeah, definitely seems to be uh, supported <laughs> by, by the outer two. Um, definitely looks larger than the other two as well, too. True. Uh, I would assume she's like Hedwig is maybe the one on the left, a little bit lighter. Yeah, and and on the Kindle version, which is what I'm looking for, uh, it's actually highlighted yellow, so it looks quite yellow. But (laughs) but it looks definitely like the lighter one, more like white. Um, And then I would assume Errol's in the middle, and then the um, Hogwarts owl mm -hmm. is on the right because he's also holding a letter. Correct. Yeah. I assume that's Hogwarts letter. Yep. And there's a nice little starry starry sky with a crescent moon in the background. Yeah. I wonder if we should check her for uh, cosmological authenticity or uh, accuracy <laughs> uh, if there was actually a crescent moon that night. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll trust her. She probably knows, right? Yes. So why don't you kick us off on some of your more in-depth notes to start off book three? Well, one of them goes right along with some of our new magic vocabulary. I absolutely love the title of Harry's essay, which burning in the 14th century was completely pointless. Discuss. It reminds me of like the Saturday Night, Saturday Night Live skit of I'm getting beclemped to talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> I'll give you a topic, which burning in the 14th Coffee century tour. was completely pointless discuss like it's very 1990s mike meyer yeah it's coffee talk we'll have coffee we'll talk, coffee it's coffee talk, talk. talk. with linda richmond <laughs> like, barbara streisand her legs are like butter yeah <laughs> it was completely pointless discuss i'm getting the clip discuss it's, the most yourselves <laughs> it's great yeah i've never thought about it that me. way but that is so much better <laughs> read it like that That's and it's so much better i want to find a way to like assign that kind of topic to my students just so i can say it like that <laughs> it was completely pointless <laughs> that's that's pretty good for sure i i love that whole discussion that like the the book the history magic book kind of goes through like how the witch burning stuff used to happen and how it never was a big deal. Like it was more right, of like, like, uh, whatever. Like the poor muggles they're they're catching. Cause man, they totally got it wrong. Right. Nobody Apparently, cares. you know, if, if they float, that's one way to check, but you know, very small rocks, very small rocks. <laughs> it's made of wood. <laughs> she tied me into a newt. I got a newt. better. I got better. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I love, I love that, that essay title as well. Um, I'm, Super excited. I realized, okay, before I say this, I know we're in a new book. Welcome to book three. But one of my biggest hangups in book two was Ron and the defective wand. So let's go with book three right away. Ron is finally getting a new wand. <laughs> right. I'm so excited. It's about time. Yeah. <laughs> get some wands up in here. Get him something that works. And it's his wand that, hey, maybe chose him, not just a hand-me-down. Right. Yeah, and that is, it's going to be interesting to see if if his magical talent is any better with a wand that has chosen him. I mean, because that's the main thing that we learn about wand lore at this point is the wand chooses the wizard. And yeah, his was a hand-me-down from Percy, who got a new wand whenever he became prefect in his fifth year. Um, and so maybe they're similar enough, you know, because they're family that it works okay but it, i don't know it'd be cool if you know this new wand really helps run out 
moving forward because we don't know if he's really a, a, a stellar student or anything it seems like he's just average but it'd be cool to see him maybe do a little bit better so my next thought is it's nice to see fred and george give trouble to bill also it's not just percy or ron like right it, it happens to it sounds like all the siblings when you know they're messing with him for um what's it called when the sneakoscope was around. Mm-hmm. And they put beetles in his soup. Yes. I like that. I wonder if they, I wonder if, so we clearly see them pick on Percy quite a bit uh, yes. throughout the first two books. Um, we, I think you could maybe justify the Ron's the little brother. So you just have to pick on him if you're the twins because he's the little brother. And I think I wonder, you have to pick on a little brother no matter how many you have. Or, you know, how old they are. Right. And, um, <laughs> I think it's interesting that Bill is singled out here because we know that he was also head boy back in the day. Charlie was the Quidditch captain. So I wonder if they pick on Charlie also. I almost think like they might not because he seems to be the cooler one. And maybe <laughs> maybe Bill is a little bit more nerdy like Percy. I mean, I, I don't know. You get the impression he might be. I mean, he works for the bank. It, yeah, he's doing curse breaking, but he and works he in banking. Boy. Right, that's what I'm saying. Like, yeah, I'd be curious to see them with Charlie to see if there's any difference of attitude between that siblingness. Yeah, I don't know. All right, Luke, let's go ahead and jump into some of your thoughts. Okay. Um, my first thought was, so there's a line in there that said, talk. Basically, it's the narrator giving some exposition, which is basically this chapter. Um. And it, it, it mentions Harry's parents, and it says, They had been murdered by the most feared dark wizard for a hundred years, Lord Voldemort. So, who was the worst dark wizard a hundred years ago? Like, <laughs> when you put a line like that, we have no history on that. Like, it makes me think, like, is that something are we there, learn? Is that, you know... Are it, there other dark wizards? Does this happen every hundred years or right. so? Is this a century plague of dark wizardry? I don't know. <laughs> It was just interesting that it was written that way, and I don't think we've gotten any kind of context of things that happened a hundred years before this, necessarily. Right. Okay, so, like, we, we know that Voldemort, Tom Riddle, kind of started 50 years ago-ish. We know he was in school 50 years ago and then became a well-known dark wizard some point after that. So, a hundred years before that would be the 1870s-ish, somewhere around there, late 1800s, right? I mean, we don't really have a bearing. I mean, you mean 50 years before that. A hundred years before Lord Voldemort became the darkest. Then that would be like the 18... 18- oh, yeah, I can you see, see that. So, he, it seems like Voldemort was well-known for several years before he killed Lily and James Potter. All right, I'll give you that. So, a hundred years before that, say 1880s, 1890s, even then. The only other dark wizards we've ever heard of are potentially Salazar Slytherin, and I've already shared my views on maybe he wasn't really a dark wizard. Um, but that was, we know, a thousand years ago or so. And the only one outside of that was the mention of, on Dumbledore's uh, magic frog card, that... Dumbledore is particularly famous for his defeat of the dark wizard Grindelwald in 1945. So that could start fitting in that range, I guess, but it seems like Grindelwald would have been uh, at large for 50, 60 years before he got taken down. If if that's the wizard that Voldemort became the most feared wizard for the... Well, one would assume that if they're saying that Voldemort is the most feared wizard, then that would make him scarier than... than the, yeah, then Grindelwald, right? I mean, so yeah. it's like who was before that? I it just makes me makes me wonder. So you would like a um, a chronological order of the dark wizards? I think wizard I just history. want a you know my own you know my own uh, text of history of magic by True. Th- by Mathilda Bagshot. I was gonna say you want the Borgen and Burks version. Uh, th- they're gonna be in there. I mean, I would think. If it's that good of a history, it should cover it, right? Yeah, history's told by the victors. Well, yeah, you, you tell of your, your, the greatest enemy that you defeated. Conquests. <laughs> so my next, my next point here, uh, Harry's hesitation at the large, strangely lopsided creature flying at his window is pretty funny. Like he, he sees this oh, kind of funny. weird, I think he says like three, three winged <laughs> animal flying at him. And then he realizes what it is yeah. when it goes over the, over the street like that's basically three owls two of which are holding arrow up i just thought it was funny the way he's like hey what is what in the world is that why are who are you and why are you flying at me 
That's very funny. My next note, and I'm I'm gonna hold back on this one a bit, but <laughs> I'm gonna Weasley bash a bit, <gasps> so I don't feel good about it. <laughs> <laughs> but i feel like it has right? to be said that we know very clearly every time they're described they're described as very nice and extremely poor it's like neville sure. he's a, a a nice boy with a round face you know a forgetful boy with a round face that's their These descriptor very they're nice, and, very very nice poor. and extremely poor so they right. win this they win this lottery and decide okay let's just go blow it all like I, they they did use it, you know, to help Ron get a new wand, and maybe their other expenses are covered. You know, maybe it's really not that bad. Maybe there really aren't that much expenses. It's just hard to maybe create just, wealth, I guess. And they have seven kids. Like you're so not, not gonna they're, they're stash not gonna it away. Wealthy, but you know, with seven kids, your money is spent in a certain way. I. Go on. I, I won't so, say my comment. I think it really kind of opens up the question of how expensive is wizarding travel? You know, like, if you can use flu powder, is there limitations on that? Like, you know, it starts opening up a lot of different questions of, I mean, we know that the parents can apparate. We know that there's flu powder. Like, how expensive is it for wizards to really travel? Well, in year one, they went to Hungary to visit Charlie. The, um, Just the parents Mr. at Mr. Christmas. Mr. and Mrs. Weasley yeah. and Ginny. And Ginny. And Ginny, yeah. So I would say they most likely have enough. They most likely have enough for at least small trips, which I mean, realize that for me to think of a small trip is to Egypt or a small trip is to Hungary is like, yeah, it's a little different. Overwhelming when when you're, when you're already in the UK or Europe traveling over there is a little bit different than us. Because we're talking relatively the same distance as traveling across the United States, which I've done in a car. Right. Right. <laughs> Driving to North Carolina to the beach, which mm-hmm. I've done three times in the last two or three years. And it's not like I have a ton of money to do it, but I'm going to visit family. So you go stay with family. Right. And we know They're that that's the them. thing that they care about most is they have a big family right. and they all love their family. Like they get along really, really well. So. Right. And so I think I almost justify it that way. Like that's exactly what I would do with that money. I would absolutely take all of my kids to go visit my oldest at his job because otherwise we would never get to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's so fair. I Now, if they were just like, hey, let's go buy a house in Mallorca, then maybe I'd question it. Maybe if Mr. Weasley worked at Grunnings, he could he could work that out. No, he needs some big drill orders for that. Yeah, so I, I think really it comes down to maybe wizarding travel isn't all that expensive. And maybe the lottery mm-hmm. money is really just covering the time that Arthur's not working more than anything. You know, it's like, hey, this is going right. to fill this gap of the time that I'm that we're gone. And, and that's a, looking well, at it that way is a little bit different, right? Right, souvenirs, food while you're traveling, those kinds of things. Sure, too. fair enough. I just thought it was worth food. Yeah, questioning. Food always gets me on travel. Oh yeah, <laughs> it, it it adds up real quick. Yeah. So. We, the the pocket sneakoscope is described as you know uh, showing if there's someone untrustworthy around. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Like we we know that Ron says it's because um, that the twins had put beetles in Bill's soup. Do you think there could be anything else that it it could be picking up? I have an idea. I feel like I guess my question is more trustworthy to who? Because I'm wondering if. Like, is it trustworthy to the owner or right. trustworthy to the person who purchased it? Because, or is it just like picking up any kind of dishonesty in a some kind of perimeter? Uh, maybe because, so let's say I'm Ron and I have the sneakoscope in my possession. Is it somebody who's directly not trustworthy to me? Like, there's somebody I personally don't trust. Or is it that somebody is doing something false? I think it's, like, I is think it's described act? the way I've, I guess, always assumed it was. It's picking up the act, some, some kind of activity of dishonesty, active dishonesty, as opposed to a, an intention by someone else necessarily. You know, it's, it's almost like a, a, okay, a deception I, tracker. I can get behind that. I guess my thought is 
if I'm Harry and I have my sneakoscope, it will always go off when Draco Malfoy is around. Because for Harry, Draco is consistently an untrustworthy person. But you're saying it's only going to go off if he is actively in the act of doing, doing something. Right. Or has maybe like very, very pronounced intentions of that. You know, like if he's actively thinking about doing something. I don't know. I, I feel like it's all about the intent. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, clearly, if Voldemort was hanging out down the street from Harry, like, yeah, I mean, that's, he he's never going to trust him, but I don't think it's picking up that. I think it's picking up, hey, there's it's something actively someone's trying to do to you to deceive you. It's kind of okay. a, yeah, a magic eight ball of, uh, <laughs> hey, watch out. All right, I'll give you that. So, I feel like the authorship, the J.K. Rowling exposition in this chapter was done differently than it was in the first two books. Did you pick up on that, or do you feel like it was pretty similar? Uh, just the overall style of that, what would you think of it? Well, the first book, like... It's hard, if book one's not required. really exposition, that's, that's creation. Yeah. Right. Book two, it was very like, I'm going to spend two pages telling you everything that happened. Mm-hmm. Book three, it was, I'm going to spend five pages telling you what happened. But the five pages are going to have such new stuff all interspersed kind of with in and out. There's so a narrative going gonna, through it. Right. Like, I'm going to tell you about fighting Voldemort, but I'm going to tell you in the context of me worrying about it from a few weeks ago. Right. Not just, hey, this happened. It was a little better in that it was not as blatantly recap and then move on to story. It was, here's my story. And this is what me as what Harry is kind of contemplating in his moment it, as he's reflecting on the year he had. Yeah, it definitely feels like it's a lot more of a present thought for Harry. It's is actively yes. something that he would naturally be thinking about. You know, it's not so much, oh, and then he remembered this one thing which made him think of Ron and that made him sad. Like it, it, it worked okay because she had already built up the emotion in book two that he felt lonely and everything. So like, it was a little different on like those ones, but there was definitely a lot of it where it's just like, oh, and the year before, Harry did da 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 da, and his parents were such 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 and such, and there's this bad guy who's blah 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 blah. This one, it really was more of like a these are the things that we we see Harry kind of going around the room and like they're actively jogging his memory to think about these things presently. Well, and we got some new information too. Yeah, we got and it's not just a description of what happened. Ron. We got so it felt more natural. Absolutely. So, because he's doing flashbacky things, and a lot of the flashbacks we've already seen, but she gave us a couple of flashbacks we hadn't seen. Mm-hmm. And there's almost like a different context to the things that we're flashing back and seeing. You know, it's not like yes. a oh, here's just a repercussion, you know, reproduction of. Yeah. What happened? It's like, oh, here's the way I'm remembering it. You know, with the context now, I can change. I don't right. just give you the facts. I can give you, well, this is kind of what happened. This is how I feel about it at this point. And it just feels a lot more natural for sure. Right. We also get Harry's Hogwarts letter. And the school year always starts on the same day. Uh huh. <laughs> is that regardless of the day of the week? I mean, clearly it seems like it. I mean, it, well, because the train always leaves September 1st. Classes always. will always start the next day from what, at least the way the letter it reads. Seems. It makes it like, and I understand it on almost everything, unless the ho- September 1st is a Saturday. Does it seem weird that they're going to start classes on like a uh, Sunday? Um, I mean, yeah, that's why I'm asking the question, I think. Because that it just feels weird. Every seven years or so, that would be guaranteed to happen. Um, right. Or more with. Right, leap you know, years and all that. Leap years and such. Yeah, I don't know. It's, so, it's, I like the idea of it because it's really neat. Like, oh, your calendar year is absolutely set. You know, it's like, this is just what it is. And maybe it's, you know, hey, if the train leave, maybe it's just the train always leaves on September 1st. Like, so it's not really a big deal if you're traveling on Saturday or Sunday and school would just start that Monday. But, but what if the train leaves on like a Thursday? You're just going to have one day of school. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm assuming. Okay. Let's see. What, what, what day of the, week was this one let's see this was 1993 correct yeah so in 1993 september 1st was a wednesday okay so class would start on thursday so thursday right. friday start not not too bad how about the following year yeah. 
Well, let's do the year before. Let's do okay. year yeah. two. Year two, it started on a Tuesday. Okay, so Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, not bad. Year one, September 1st was a Sunday. That's so perfect. Travel on Sunday, get there Monday, or right. start school Monday. Right. Now for year four, September 1st is a f- f- Thursday. Okay. So you have one day of class, one day then a weekend. Year five... September 1st is a Friday. Okay. So you get there, so you the party around. a little harder uh, the Well, but the imagine beginning of those your feast. first years. Like you come up on the beginning of your feast and you have two days of wandering around a castle with no direction and no class and not knowing. Right. So I think that seems let's go ahead and let's make a note of this that on, oh, in those books, let's, let's revisit what day of the week mm. it is and see how is it discussed or, you know, is. Does it change the way we perceive the chapters as they go? I don't know. I will say year six, 1996, um, September 1st is a Sunday. So it works out really well for at least two of the years. Yeah. Fair enough. Two of seven. (laughs) Hey, you know, you guys start somewhere, right? Yes. So my final thought before we jump into my five questions is that this was a very difficult chapter to kind of like recap and read all by itself because it is even though the exposition was weaved into the narrative a little better it still was just an exposition very little narrative really bed right yeah he gets yeah. out of bed from doing homework gets a he couple packages and goes back to bed <laughs> like, trying to write the summary for that was a little difficult because you're like but there's nothing going on right either i tell you about every piece of mail that he got or (laughs) we just say he got some mail yeah it was very how do i do this but my other thought is really this chapter was not designed for you to read independent of the next right because it's an introduction it is designed to suck you in and keep going yeah definitely so to stop after it was very difficult yeah i agree i agree okay So let's jump into my five burning questions. All right. I am ready. Okay. Where did Ron call Harry from? Well, let's see. So pay phones would definitely be a thing. True. But they would need muggle money to use it. Also true. So then we have the whole is muggle money easily accessible by wizards, which we've got a whole discussion from last book about that we had to walk away from because... We just well, didn't see eye to high on it. <laughs> I would assume that since Hermione's parents at the at the beginning of last book had to go exchange muggle money for wizarding money at Gringotts. Right. That you'd have to do the opposite. It would still have to happen at Gringotts, though. Yes. Right. Yeah. And so maybe they keep a small stash. So Or, because I doubt they have one at the borough, unless Mr. Weasley got one hooked up just by tinkering with it, but... We know that even he was new to the idea, so maybe he picked one up after that. It's possible, because I know Harry said that he had described how to use one to Mr. Weasley last summer when they were hanging out together. Uh, maybe. So maybe in the past year, he went out and got one and was like, hey, Ron, this is a cool thing that Harry showed me. Let's use it and call Harry. That's what I'm going to say my answer is. Oh, I thought he probably went into town. And that's where I was going at first with the payphones, but... Well, I don't necessarily think it might have been payphone. It could have been like, you know, the local restaurant or market Mm -hmm. or something. But like, hey, you know, I don't know. Yeah. It'd be interesting to see the phone call from his scene from his side where to where where he was standing and shouting into the phone from like the point of view of the muggles around exactly that would be that'd be pretty funny to yeah, see for sure awesome. all right which present would you want the sneakoscope the broomstick servicing kit or the monster book of monsters broomstick servicing kit for sure uh, that would mean that i would have to have a broom as well uh, i'll go ahead and <laughs> i'll go ahead and get one awesome yeah no flying would would be I'm not. I'm not a real paranoid person, so uh, sneak a scope wouldn't be too high on my list. And that seems like a pretty dangerous book. I'd be worried for my three year old's life. Oh, true. I didn't even think yeah, about my. Seems kids. like a, it seems like a real, uh, real, real hazard to have around the house. Man, you're a lot nicer parent than I am. I was thinking, man, that'd be a cool book to have. <laughs> it's a little easier that with just like one choice. to one to think about. <laughs> well, and my kids are slightly bigger. Yeah, they could. Yeah, for the most at part. least two out of three could 
At least one out of three could. Working together. Yeah, one, <laughs> one of them totally's got it. Yeah, the other definitely. two. It, we have to work together. Uh, throw rocks. And that's that's a right. questionable act as well. I actually think I would go with the sneakoscope. Okay. Any reason? Oh, I can find many because here's the Working thing. at school. I don't want. That's, that's why. That's a pretty I big benefit. presents that are um, practical in my real life. I feel like a sneakoscope, if I just sat that in my classroom and was like, look, you see that? You see that? I know. I know everything. <laughs> and I can prove it. Like, it just sits. Like, it has its own little stand in the middle. It fits my evil teacher persona. <laughs> I kind of like it. Yeah. No, that it fits. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Imagine, like, that being in the principal's office. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> That'd be awesome. I didn't do that. That wasn't me. I... Thing goes off. Oh, Ooh, uh, about that. Okay, I might have had a hand in it. Can I, can, can I rephrase my answer, please? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I would like to plead the fifth at this point. Yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna stop denying and just start going away from answering. <laughs> right. Let's let's go with I. I don't. I don't remember. I'm unaware right, of any such, such action. <laughs> um. How does the Daily Profit fund its annual galleon draw? And then how does one enter the annual galleon draw? So I would, I would think that'd be subscribers that, you know, you, you're subscribed to the magazine or the, the, the newspaper, newspaper and your name is on the list. So I think you're eligible okay. at that point. I think maybe whatever you pay, which we saw Hagrid pay when he got his paper in on, on the hut, on the rock, in the sea. And he, he paid, he made Harry pay the owl, um, when he dropped it off. So I would think that maybe a portion of that gets funneled into it every year and that would, that would cover it. When you have a lot of subscribers and they pay every single day, I mean, it's literally a daily newspaper. So it should be pretty, pretty fluid cash. Okay. What do you think? Well, I feel like as a corporation, they probably have enough money to like, have this kind of drawing every year. You're going to keep subscribers Again, from, if they have an option. I mean, or opportunity. Right. Well, not just subscribers, but like all of their profits. The daily profits. And not profit like, right. Not, not profits that, like, you know, future guessers, but like, you know, the money you make. They should probably have enough money to do that, to sort of give back. Mm -hmm. I like the idea that it, people who are subscribed to the newspaper are automatically entered mm -hmm. because it gives you incentive to stay subscribed. Exactly. And get new subscribers. You're like, hey, I mean, even if you don't right. read the paper, there's, it's like... It's a great might, marketing. Might as well, right? <laughs> yeah. I'm in. All right. Question four. How would you contain your copy of the Monster Book of Monsters? Hmm. So he wraps it up with a belt. Yes. Hmm. I would try to feed it treats <laughs> and make it friendly. I think okay. that'd be my at least first to see if I could make it less uh, hostile. Oh, okay. All right. Befriend okay, the beast. Befriend okay. the beast. How about you? Any right. ideas? I would drop a rock on it. Big, heavy rock. Not very small rocks. Not a very small rock. Big rock. A big rock. Big boulder. Okay. <laughs> very big rock. The biggest rock I could possibly lift and actually drop accurately on the book and not my toes. And probably get it inside of your house to drop onto it. Mm -hmm. True. I was going to say, yes. or else it might escape. All right. A medium heavy rock. Okay. A reasonably sized rock. Or, no, even better. Um, I would, my container of wood from my fireplace, I'd pick that up there and drop go. it on it. It's got some heft to it. Yes. And then I can add more wood to it mm -hmm. once it's on there to yeah. make it really stick. Fair enough. Okay. Good done. answer. Got Good it. answer. Question five. Why would the monster book of monsters be useful? Well, you're going to have less rodents around the house. That seems to be true. Um, ah. you know, it's, it's like a, it's like a small terrier dog. You know, they're okay. designed to, Catch rodents. It feels it feels similar to that. <laughs> um, yes. Other than that, maybe if you be like I said, befriend the beast. It might teach you. Maybe it has some actual good text in there. It's just you got to be friends with it first. I don't. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. So, Luke, what was your favorite line? My favorite line is at the end of Hermione's letter, and it says, Ron said Percy's head boy. I'll bet Percy's really pleased. Ron doesn't seem too happy about it. <laughs> I just think it's funny that, you know, Hermione doesn't really care, but she knows that it's going to tick Ron off. <laughs> right. And 
the twins aren't going to be <laughs> pleasant either, I'm sure. How about you? What was your favorite line this chapter? <clears throat> Indeed, Wendell and the Weird enjoyed being burned so much that she allowed herself to be caught no less than 47 times in various disguises. I love the various disguises. That just makes it so much better. <laughs> because if she go, just goes at her, as herself, somebody's going to recognize her as somebody who's already died. We've already burned this one. <laughs> Hold on. Wait. You you look familiar. <laughs> Have I seen you here before? I had a sister. Ah, uh, no. That only no, works so no, many times. No. It wasn't me. I am I believe that was my neighbor. We, <laughs> we practice witchcraft together. She taught me everything Ooh. I know. <laughs> Can I be burned now, please? <laughs> uh, one for the burning, please. <laughs> I'll take the burning. Yes, I could have the large stick to be tied to this time. I mean, Can I, I'll have two extra large burnings with a <laughs> with, with a side of steak. <laughs> why, why do you need two? I have a friend. I don't want to live She'll away from this mess. Be here later. <laughs> She's reading my books now, my witchcraft books. She'll be ready soon. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so in this chapter, we didn't really hear a lot of, about a whole lot of characters. <laughs> Who is your chapter MVP here? Well, I feel like I'm going to give it to Arthur Weasley for okay. winning money. Just for sheer dumb luck? <laughs> Pretty much. You won money. You spent it on your family. I can appreciate that. You bought your son a wand. That's the key, I think. Finally. I feel like I can let it go now. There you go. You can, Now you Let's can move on finally. I, now I can move on. It took me a while. We know. I was really worried. <laughs> my my honorable mention this chapter is going to go to Hedwig, I think. Ah. Because, <laughs> you know, it, <laughs> I, I guess. I don't feel 100% sure about it, but there's not a whole lot of other candidates. One way or the other, she appeared in the chapter. Uh, And and she helped support Errol, get, you know, getting her in the window. She flew all the way to France. And that's the real big thing is she does make sure that Harry gets something for his birthday. Um, and so that's, it's just nice to see her get a little more personification. Um, and she, she clearly cares about Harry. Um, she's doing her best to make sure that he's not so lonely. And so that's, and she actually has to fly around now that she's not being locked up. Um, True. So it's just a good, a good Hedwig chapter. <laughs> <laughs> Count <Yeah>. it. <laughs> <laughs> well, people, thanks for joining us for the start of book three. We're glad that you, we are glad that you have decided to continue on this journey with us. Special thank you to Jason for this chapter's summary. We would love to hear from you on a variety of social media platforms. You can find us on Twitter at not named podcast when, and if we ever check that. So check us out and see if we actually respond back. You can email us at the podcast that must not be named at gmail.com. And you can find us on our website, the podcast that.com where we have a variety of different shows from our podcast that family of shows we are also on facebook and youtube you can find us there as well yep subscribe and rate us on itunes leave comments there uh it really does go a long way to getting us more exposure and we would love to hear your thoughts uh what do you like about the show what don't you like about the show uh anything what was the funniest part of book two that you thought that we missed? Um, let us know. We appreciate it. Join us again next week as we start discussing chapter two. Aunt Marge's big mistake. Stay imaginary. Thank you. <laughs>